thanks for coming back. This week on Only in America, as immigrants across the country fear deportation, one school principal tells them, your children will be safe in class. Calling uh, for uh, Latino families tonight with a very special message. We recognize the anxiety in the community related to the recent ICE arrest. The teachers and staff are using important strategies we've learned to meet the emotional needs of your child and support them during this difficult time. We encourage you to send your children to school. And as Central American migrants line up at the southern border, more mixed messages from the president. You know, the unemployment picture is so good, it's so strong, that we have to let people come in. Our immigration laws in this country are a total disaster. They're laughed at all over the world. They're laughed at for their stupidity. And we have to have strong immigration laws. And walking in Memphis while brown. My conversation with a pastor who uses the Bible to teach love towards immigrants and refugees. Last month, he was stopped by police for being Latino. I experienced this for eight to 10 minutes. No telling how undocumented immigrants who pay taxes, who are a part of churches, who thrive and are good people, are good neighbors, have been here for 10 plus years. No telling how they feel every single day because they are subject to face this every day because of ICE subjecting all immigrants to deportation. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani with Only in America. Across the country, Immigration and Customs Enforcement continue their crusade to arrest and deport immigrants. After last week's raids in North Carolina, the food and tourism industries felt the strain of having the majority of their workforce fear leaving their homes. Restaurant owner Mike Moore, a former law enforcement officer, said, It's like we're going against the grain of how America was started. And at the national level, Scott Minard, the chief investment officer of Guggenheim Partners, told Bloomberg that for the U.S. to maintain economic growth, it would require a pragmatic resolution on the status of undocumented workers and dreamers, along with appropriate policies and controls around future immigration, which is all great. But let's take a minute to put the economics aside. So imagine you are a Latino immigrant living in an immigrant community. Your child, born in the U.S., loves going to school. They learn to read, to write, to add, subtract. They are Americans living in an immigrant family. Then you get a voicemail from the school's principal. It isn't because your child is misbehaving. It isn't because they're sick. Rather, it is the principal reassuring you that your child will be safe in the school. That is the voicemail Latino parents in one community received. Take a listen. We recognize the anxiety in the community related to the recent ICE arrest. The teachers and staff are using important strategies we've learned to meet the emotional needs of your child and support them during this difficult time. We encourage you to send your children to school and let us provide this safe space for them to learn. We are reaching out to community organizations to see how we can be supportive to your children and to the Latino families. Please communicate any concerns that you have about school attendance so that we can work towards a solution. Now keep in mind, almost 17 million Latinos under 18 are U.S. citizens. When they're going to the voting booth for that first time, they aren't going to remember being called a name at school. They are going to remember why their principal called their parents. It was because the administration wanted to deport their community. Meanwhile, at the San Ysidro border crossing in Southern California, the caravan of migrants wait patiently to turn themselves into Border Patrol and begin the asylum process. But I have questions. Why are they being forced to wait on a cold plaza to begin an asylum process? Why didn't U.S. Customs and Border Protection allocate the necessary resources to manage the processing of these migrants? particularly since the National Guard was deployed with such grand fanfare. Look, the arrival of the, quote, caravan was not a surprise. We've been talking about this for weeks. The administration's failure to be ready is a moral decision, not a policy decision. But what is clear is that President Trump thinks women and children sleeping on pavement, waiting to turn themselves into the authorities, makes for good politics. Countering the disinformation about the migrants and their backgrounds, Enrique Acevedo spoke to Fox News anchor Martha McCollum to set the record straight. 
But I think the public here in the United States needs to recognize that the largest factor driving undocumented immigrants into the country is not a weak, unprotected border. These immigrants are very aware of the dangers they face, and still they choose to risk their lives to provide a better future for their family. We used to call that the American dream, and now Attorney General Jeff Sessions calls it an intent to overwhelm our, our legal system. Before we get to our guest, something fun. This week, the Immigration Resource Center of Maine celebrates its anniversary. Founded in 2002 by Fatima Hussein, a Somali immigrant who fled the United States due to civil war. Not long after her arrival in Maine, Fatima applied for a grant to create a women's center that provides language skills and other resources to immigrants. More proof that, yes, immigrants and refugees make America great. I'm Ali Nirani. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the James Irvine Foundation, expanding opportunity for the people of California, and from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. This is Only in America. I'm Ali Nirani. In Memphis, Tennessee, Rondell Trevino founded the Immigration Project to demonstrate how the Bible teaches us to reach out and embrace immigrants. He's also a pastor at the Woodland Presbyterian Church in Memphis. Rondell received a Bachelor of Arts in Biblical Studies from Belhaven and a Master of Divinity from Capitol Seminary. He's lobbied in Washington for immigration reform and is devoted not just to his wife, Laura, who is an immigrant from El Salvador, and their new daughter, Sophia, but he's also dedicated to his Dallas Cowboys. Now, of course, the Cowboys conversation is a different episode of Only in America. But for this episode, Rondell and I chatted about his efforts to encourage communities to embrace immigrants and about his encounter with law enforcement in his hometown. One project we have is equip uh, churches. So we want to just equip the church on God's heart for the immigrant and to wrestle with these complex issues around immigration. And then we also want to advocate biblically. So we want to advocate for immigrants affected by injustice, with immigrants affected by injustice, and by immigrants affected by injustice, so that we can hold people and institutions accountable for creating, implementing, and sustaining good policies and practices towards the flourishing uh, of society. And this has been the hard one, because I think the church separates uh, biblical advocacy on the legislative level. They think that we aren't called to do that. But I I think clearly um, in this powerful book called Advocating for Justice, it's making the case that we're called because the Holy Spirit is our advocate. We're called to advocate um, not only for basic needs of the immigrant, but also from a legislative level to help them flourish in society. And then we write articles. And so we write a ton of articles. We have a ton of contributors. We have around 13,000 subscribers. And so uh, we write just the, just the pressing issues of the day, like we were talking about the caravan yesterday I'm at the U.S.-Mexico border and what does that really mean? And then we finally provide scholarships. We partnered with a, a school called the Memphis Center for Urban Theological Studies at Lancaster Bible College. And uh, we provide full tuition scholarships for DACA recipients because, you know, in Tennessee, They have to pay out-of-state tuition if they want to go to college, and it's really hard to pursue higher education after they graduate. And so we want to provide them with scholarships so they can pursue their dreams. So where does the power of story fit into the work that you do with pastors and, and your membership at large? Most of the time when I get invited to talk to a staff or speak, it's because of the fact that I sat down with the pastor uh, or the leaders of the church and talked to them about my story and how my wife, uh, you know, we came here legally, but it took two years uh, from 2014 to 2016 for her immigration, uh, for our I-130 petition to get approved. So we, we don't use our story to uh, say that everybody needs to come the right way because we understand the complexities and we understand that I was a, I'm was a U.S. citizen. Uh, my wife is uh, was decently well off over, the, over there in El Salvador. She was educated. Um, so we use that our story to talk about, you know, we, we were one in a million. And uh, we use that to talk about how many other immigrants who really deserve probably to come here more than my wife don't have that opportunity because of the, the visa backlogs and the, and the broken system. And so once we share that and talk about that, they kind of open up their doors and open up their hearts to wanting to hear more because, you know, it's, it's that saying of, you know, you want to listen to somebody who's been through it. So that allows us an avenue to talk about this and to really educate the church. So speaking of story, you know, something happened you know, to you in the last week or two uh, in Memphis. And 
I wanted to invite you to, to share that story of you know what took place. And before we even get to what the solution is, really what was going through your mind as that unfolded? Yeah, I, um, I go, I've been trying to get in shape. So w- Laura and I... You're trying, to, you're trying to get back into shape to get back out on the court, yeah, aren't you? the key word is trying. So, <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, my wife and I intentionally wanted to move into an immigrant community uh, just to love them and to learn from them um, and to be, befriend them um, as God calls us to. And so we, we intentionally live in, in an immigrant community. And uh, I was walking after work around six-ish and a cop pulled up to me and he said, hey man, can you stop? And I was like, sure. And I was a little nervous at the time because I was reissuing my license. But thankfully, I always hold my social security card with me in my wallet ever since my mom gave it to me when I was younger. And now I'm understanding that this is probably why, because of that, I probably would have been detained. Who knows? And he was like, hey, can I see your documentation? And uh, and I said, usually I I use the, I'm a uh, pastor at a church and I have a nonprofit. And and the guy was like, well, you know, I don't, I don't care. I still want to see your documentation. And so I gave him my social security card and he was like, wow, I can't believe you're a citizen. I thought you had been an illegal alien because you're Latino. And that was shocking to me because if anybody knows me, I'm like, a Mexican American, but I'm like a third, fourth generation. I'm far. If you talk like you're talking to me right now, you would never think I'm an I'm an immigrant ever. And so f- for that, I'm like far from being an immigrant, you know. And and it's just like they still racially profile the cop racially profiled me. And I told him I was like, okay, I understand. He was like, well, we're out here to get uh, illegal aliens, and and you know, just that term of illegal alien, it's just like they're somewhere from another world, you know. It's just so inferior. And he wasn't aggressive, but he was like a cop, right? Just trying to get the job done. But he saw it as, as his job to track down somebody who's undocumented. And so I used that to share on Twitter, but it wasn't for me to draw attention to myself. I, as you, as people read it, I used it to shake, to, to like, when I was walking home in awe, in shock, I was just like, dude, I experienced this for eight to 10 minutes. No telling how undocumented immigrants who pay taxes, who are a part of churches, who uh, thrive and are good people, are good neighbors, have been here for 10 plus years, no telling how they feel every single day because they they are subject to face this every day uh, because of ICE subjecting all immigrants to deportation. And so I just use that as a way to say, man, if I experienced that and I was fearful, and if they're stopping me, a U.S. citizen, no telling what's going to happen. And so I was in shock. And then the next day, I heard that there was a bill that is that has gone to uh, Governor Haslam's desk right now. And I just found out yesterday that he has to decide if he's going to sign the bill on Cinco de Mayo <laughs> this Saturday. Out of all places, like, it's just crazy. And we have two great events going on in Memphis Saturday. There's, a, there's an amazing event for Latinos and immigrants going on at a church. And there's also what we call the Cup of Nations in Memphis as well, where there's 16 teams from different parts of the country who are going to play each other on Cinco de Mayo. And I'm just thinking like, man, they're going to be playing and no telling what his decision will be. And so, you know, this bill is going to subject and compel local law enforcement to embrace what ICE is doing. That that just heightens the fear now even more. And so it's just really, it's just a really scary time, to be honest with you. I just don't know what's going to happen. You see those, the women and the children waiting in San Ysidro to turn themselves over to CBP and apply for asylum. You know, do you see your family's, the a potential of your family story in, in their eyes as well? It feels like they're willing to be separated from their family for a, an amount of time in order for them to be safe in the U.S. It just blows my mind how much courage these individuals show and demonstrate and how much we can learn from them. And if, as a Christian, if I'm not empathetic to what they're going through and they're willing to sacrifice their lives to come to the border and they're willing to be separated from their families in order for their families to be protected. I would question how how deep my relationship is with the Lord, you know, because it's just devastating and it just breaks my heart. In the the responses that you've gotten from your friends and your community after uh, sharing your story, um, are people asking the question of, okay, how could this happen in Memphis? There have been a lot of pastors and leaders in the city who have reached out to me and they're like, man, Rondell, you're just, we're thankful that you shared that story because we're starting to see the dangers that undocumented immigrants face. Um, and so sharing that story has really opened up people's hearts to uh, have more empathy towards undocumented immigrants. Um, and, and we're gradually helping pastors understand that even if they're undocumented, there's still a lot of them, many of them who deserve to stay in the U.S., pay a fine because they are good people. Um, and so I am excited about where we're headed in Memphis. 
And then what do you tell members of the Latino community who, you know, they may be U.S. US citizens, they may be legal residents like your wife, or they may be undocumented? I tell them, you know, the church is starting to wake up. I know I'm so sorry that it's moving slowly, but I promise you we're, we're trying, we're, we're moving forward and we're trying to take as big a step as we can. But at the same time, I lay it's still hard because, you know, sometimes I don't know what to say. You know, I'm just like, I don't know what to say. You know, just be safe, watch out. And Saturday night, I got a call from a brother who's undocumented, who's an elder of a church. And he's asking me, you know, hey, brother, can hey, Hamano, can you take me to uh, me and my family to church tomorrow? Because we're afraid because of what you went through. We're afraid to be detained from ICE. I mean, this is an elder of a church, loves his family, loves Jesus. And he's afraid to to go to church. I mean, that's that's a travesty. Right. It's, it's just it's terrible. Um, and so I think when the church begins to realize this and they are, we begin to see, okay, we have more empathy towards finding ways to love them, to care for them, to be there for them. So let's say you're, you know, you're going to meet with governor Haslam on Thursday or, or he's listening to this podcast and he's grappling with, okay, does he sign this bill or not? What's your message to, to the governor? Mine would be understand that this bill is not necessarily a, a political move. It's a, a move that's going to affect thousands of undocumented immigrants in Tennessee. And it's going to subject good-hearted undocumented immigrants to deportation. And so I would say your decision is going to be bigger than just Tennessee. I feel like it's going to ripple effect in the Southeast on how uh, conservative Christians, um, how progressive Christians, how people in all cities view immigrants and how fearful immigrants will be every single day when, when they're going to work, when they're trying to go to school, when they're trying to go for a walk, when they're trying to go uh, grocery shopping. It's just going to affect them even more so than it is right now. Hey, Rundell, thank you very much for, for sharing your story. I really appreciate the time. And um, my last question for you is to finish the sentence of um, only in America, dot, dot, dot. Only in America, can we as Christians really embrace the immigrant, documented and undocumented, and love them as God has called us to? Thank you, man. I really, really appreciate it. Appreciate you, man. There's more about Rondell Trevino, his life and work at immigrationforum.org. While you're there, take a minute to subscribe to Only in America. And please tell a friend about the podcast. Only in America is produced by Emily Chow and Regina Medina. The executive producer is Kathleen Farrell. I'm Ali Nirani. Please join us again next week.